Thank you very much. And, and the honour is entirely mine. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this in your lovely city, which I did a little plod around this morning, and this fantastic venue. It makes a change that the, the PowerPoint works. I, tend a lot, I spend a lot of time going to these universities and these synthetic biologists, you know, they can't get the PowerPoint to work. You do worry about them re-engineering the genome. But um, one thing you also ought to know is prior to my 15 years looking at responsible innovation, I spent 20 years in communications like you, but not quite the august and important and exciting work that we saw earlier. I was promoting crisps and washing powder and dog food. In fact, I am the proud organiser of the biggest dog's dinner in the world, which was a thousand dogs eating their dinner, their spillers dog food at one time in a big field in Worcestershire and I was in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> so as you can see, you know, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Synthetic biology, it's nothing, is it, to that, compared to that. So um, that was quite an interesting trajectory and a different move um, from from communications to, to responsible innovation. Um, but what I want to do today is talk to you about particularly as a, from an overview of my presentation here, you know, where did it all begin? Why are we now suddenly looking at and talking about responsible innovation? And this is particularly from a UK point of view. I think you've had different issues and different countries had different issues, but I think you might sort of feel some sort of empathy with the sort of route that we've shown. Um, and a bit about what responsible innovation is, responsible research and innovation, um, and the potential and the opportunity for science communicators. Um, but also the barriers and some of the incentives and some of the practicalities, I think, that we're all finding and share those with you. So this is a UK perspective, um, but it's also based on, on thinking and work um, around Europe in the US. So um, a long time ago, I did my master's degree in responsibility and business practice. And my idea was I would go and find all the leaders in corporate responsibility, all the real great companies in sustainability and responsibility, and find out what led them there and what stimulated them to become leaders and to be, you know, to really take these issues to heart. And I have found out through you know, literature review and talking to people that in fact it was a crisis. All but one company had a really dramatic crisis. They'd done something really bad and they thought, oh, you know, we have to change. And actually on the course that I was doing coincidentally was a senior person from the one company. And I said, you know, Lisa, you are the only company that's really become a leader in corporate responsibility without a, oh, we had a terrible crisis. It nearly brought the company down, we do had a terrible ethical crisis. So there are zero companies who are leaders in corporate responsibility that haven't done this from a disastrous crisis point of view. And I sort of think that responsible innovation is a little bit the same. It's all about, oh my God, we don't want another something or other. And the next big thing becomes a component of responsible innovation. So let's see what I'm trying to say. We had mad cow disease in the UK, and I don't think you had this, in the 90s. This was where it was somebody's great idea to feed dead cows ground up to live cows who are herbivores as food. And um, they had a, 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 sort of a, a big disease of cows was then passed on to the live cows and then passed on to humans. Um, and you, you see there the picture there of, of we had to slaughter all the, all the cows in England pretty much. And the next picture is, is the, the, uh, the politician feeding a burger to his daughter to say, no, no, the, it's all right, it's all hyped, this, this um, BSE. But what happened because of this particularly dramatic um, problem we had in our food chain is that the British people felt, no, we can't trust our food anymore and we can't trust our politicians anymore. He's feeding it his daughter. And, it, you, know, we, you know, we had a really big problem. We couldn't eat burgers for years type thing. Um, but what came out of that, the governance that came out of that, was very much about food production standards. We're really transformed. We have our Food Standards Agency, um, but the sort of work that they were doing really started to snowball after that scare. And we also had the increase in concerns about um, the, the organics, um, the response to that was a, a sort of more back to nature a, a version of the food chain. 
And I think the next big thing there from, from our point of view was it was all now about considering unintended consequences of your innovation. It was about listening to others because a lot of people had been saying, oh, no, you don't want to feed cows to herbivores because they're herbivores. But they weren't listened to. So there was this sort of feeling we start to listen to people a little bit more. And then we had genetically modified foods. We would not be here if it wasn't for genetically modified foods, let me tell you. So in the 2000s, you see there, you know, the trashers of the fields. I think, I don't know how much of that you had actually, but it was very big for us. So even very recently, we had um, the environmental NGOs pulling up the trial fields of genetically modified crops. There is golden rice, saviour of the you know, saviour of the world in terms of, um, of helping um, children with their vitamin A and therefore preventing them from going blind, which we're not actually currently using. And what we thought, the people about that was, oh my God, the companies are taking over our food chain. The Monsanto, these big American giants are taking us over. The science is weird and it's unsafe and they're messing around with nature and we don't really want anything to do with it. And the environment is at risk from science. That was the popular narrative in the media and in, I around there. And the governance to that, the precautionary principle, the European precautionary principle started to, be, to get more traction around that time. And this idea of technology assessment, which I think is, is bigger in some countries than others. I mean, in England, it wasn't so big. I think it's bigger here and in Denmark. But this idea, we really need to think more carefully about our science and our technology, and we need to think in advance about potential potential um, pitfalls started then. But the, the next big thing was science communication because the public is a little bit stupid. And if we talk to them very slowly, in words of one syllable with pictures, they will then understand that science is good and they made a mistake about genetically modified foods. That was the next big thing. And science communication in the UK really boomed after that. Um, and still, to be honest, that is a little bit the narrative. We call it the deficit model. There is a deficit of understanding in the small brains of the masses that if we were to enlighten them with our brilliance, then all would be well and we could carry on with our science um, without any interference. And then we had the cloning scandal. Now, I don't know how much that resonated with you. I hadn't appreciated until I was researching for this how it resonated here. Um, there was some fraudulent science in, in South Korea on cloning. And it rocked our science community. The fact that science, the, the pinnacle of integrity, um, could have been proven to have been deliberately fraudulent. And, and a, a respected scientist could deliberately fake results for scientific kudos. And so, you know, we thought, and, and that, was the, that was the policy land as well. We must root out these scientific fraudsters. They are polluting our, our scientific integrity. Um, and the governance around that, particularly in the UK, it was quite a big thing for us. Um, the, uh, Sir David King um, developed these principles for the um, ethical code for scientists. And this was very much about the procedures of science, about science and ethics, and about science and integrity. And this concept of research integrity, which is very big in the UK, we have whole research integrity departments in universities, came out of that particular scandal and then starting to look at science and look at, well, you know, are they really telling us the truth? And for us, Asbestos is massive. 1898, the first examples that asbestos was bad were found. And here we are in 2016, and it's still being used in a lot of the world, and it's killed hundreds of thousands of people. You do have to wonder sometimes, don't you? Um, but that started the conversation about small particles with nanotechnology, and that's where I came into the scene with this, which is nanotechnology was the next big thing. How do we learn from GM and the others? But the dominant narrative of nanotechnology was we must be more careful in the toxicology of small particles, because asbestos is a certain shape and a certain size of particle, and it gets stuck, and it doesn't get flushed out by your, your breathing in and out. And that was the big dominant narrative about uh, five or six years ago. 
and the governance of that. This was the first time the Commission had got really involved in terms of specific technologies. So it developed the principles for responsible nanotechnology at the Commission, which somebody in DT Enterprise told me, which is saying something, this is the worst piece of paper that's ever been put out by the European Commission, <laughs> which was interesting. But it was written by a couple of social scientists in the Science and Society Department who never asked anybody else about it for a while. Anyway, it's a long story. We also, that matter was the responsible nanocode at that time, and we developed through stakeholder engagement in Europe, in the US, something called the responsible nanocode. And matter actually changed from the responsible nano forum to matter because we realized that the issues of responsible, um, the sp of responsible nano were actually in common to a lot of technologies, the synthetic biology, the robotics, all of those technologies. So the next big thing was we need to understand novel risks. So there are new odd risks with these new odd technologies and we need to think about that. And we need to think about toxicology in the environment and toxicology differently. And now we've got synthetic biology, we've got 3D printing, we've got artificial intelligence, we've got robotics, we've got the lot. And for me, the, do the dominant narrative is, oh my God, it's all going too fast. It's all going too fast. It's all too scary. Do we even want any of this stuff? Do we even want this stuff the scientists are putting on us? And I think that's really where responsible innovation comes along, in that there are many technologies now going very quickly. We're seeing a lots of repercussions that are speedier than we expected with things like ICT, obviously the whole mobile um, area. And that's where a lot of these responsible innovation frameworks started to go f come from. We've got the, the EC Responsible in Innovation Research Projects, 13 million euros, honestly, and I don't understand a word of anything they've put, but that's for another day. EPSRC, which is our, our um, Euro, um, Physical Sciences Research Council, um, and we did our principles for responsible innovation out of that uh, whole multiple technology concept. So responsible innovation is the next big thing, or responsible research, as they all say in Brussels, and innovation is the next thing. And for me, it's a combination of all those things. It's a response to all those things. So. When, you, when I come next to talking about responsible innovation, you'll see it's quite confused and it's quite disparate and you'll talk to different people and they'll start to say that responsible innovation is one thing and it's that thing and it's that thing and it's that thing. But if you look about where we've come from and you look at some of those big problems, that's why that is, because different people in different areas and different perspectives are worried about different things and have different solutions. So let's have a quick look about what responsible innovation is now. Here's a definition for you. There's loads of definitions around and they're all very long and, and some of them are quite short, but they're a bit difficult. This is mine. The focus of research and innovation on social good without causing more problems than you solve. That is it for me, really. So let's have a quick look there. Can you see that okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm mapping out the main principles and projects of responsible innovation for you. And you'll see that there are, there are these little boxes, when, I'm, when I do that, when they come down here, a lot of them are about how, how we do innovation. And a lot of them are about what sort of things have we got to worry about when we're doing innovation? And some of them are about why we should be bothering about doing this in the first place. Now, hopefully this will make a bit more sense when you see them. So this first one is from um, f the uh, our, um, Economic and Physical Sciences Research Council. And it was quite a big project for the UK, but it's also quite big in Europe. It's the foundation of the FRICT project, which was a, um, an ICT responsible innovation project. And it's the basis for a lot of, uh, of these sort of uh, Horizon 2020 technology specific projects. Now, what they're talking about is the how. How do we do it? How do researchers think differently about their work? How do innovators think differently? But this is really focused on scientific research in universities, to be fair. The innovation piece doesn't come in much. So one has to anticipate 
and that's about anticipating negative consequences and anticipating positive consequences, but mainly negative. It's about reflecting on the things that you find out of your, uh, your anticipation. It's about thinking more deeply and more broadly about your work, about its impacts, about the consequences of actions. It's about engaging with other people. It's about engaging beyond your normal remit, which is very much the heart of responsible innovation from, from uh, the, the central concept of it still is about stakeholder involvement. You can't do these things on your own. Your, uh, one of your definitions is very, uh, uh, that we saw earlier, which is about openness, openness, open to the world. We think responsible innovation is more than that. It's about bringing society in. It's not just saying, look, we're here and we're open. We're expecting you know, society to be brought into that process, to engage and involve. And then you've got to do something about it and do something a bit different about it. That's always the tricky bit. We can do a lot of dialogue and a lot of very interesting, thoughtful stuff, and then we just carry on doing what we already did already. This is the European Commission principles for responsible research and innovation. There were five and they've added some more recently. Now this is a pretty much a what thing. You have got to do good stuff on gender. You must do public engagement. You have to do science education, open access, ethics, and these last three, sustainability, uh, no, I think sustainability, governance, and social justice have just been added. No, I think governance was in there. So these are more about what it looks like if you're doing doing responsible innovation right. Now, I personally think that's very narrow. I mean, gender is one thing, but diversity and inclusion and, you know, there's, there's, I think that's too narrow, personally. And, but therefore, a lot of your scientists and a lot of the people in all of the, the research projects will be getting these hoops to jump through, through your Horizon 2020 projects from now on. So whether, and, and one of the difficulties is, is this quite right that it should be so narrow? We want it to be broader. Um, this one, I chaired this one, three and a half million euros, and my job with Greenpeace and Unilever, who were on the advisory board with us, was to allow this project to be communicable and open and accessible. <coughs> I failed. Inclusion, moderation, deliberate, modularity and flexibility. That was my favorite. Followed by subsidiarity, whatever that is. Adaptability, cap capabilities, capacities, institutional entrepreneurship and a culture of transparency, tolerance and all. Catchy, catchy stuff that was. Now, actually, you know what? I'm not even going into this. I am, we'll find out on Monday morning when RRI Tools is launched if they've come up with something that's usable for us. I was really disappointed in this. In fact, I refused to go to the last bit of the last conference because and, and Unilever and Greenpeace refused to go to some of their meetings because they said, if this is not accessible and fit for purpose, we're not playing, which they were a bit shocked at, the, the academics. This is our principles for responsible innovation based on the, um, the nano code. Ours is very much about understanding benefits and impacts, a rounder picture of benefits and impacts, but not just the usual impact of perhaps environmental impact. Looking at social impacts, that might be livelihoods, it might be you know, social impact on, co in, on communities, ethical issues, doing some work in robotics, you know, do we want robots for dementia patients? That's tricky stuff. Environmental benefits and impacts, cultural benefits and in impacts. What is the, what will be the cultural issues associated with ICT, with some of these areas? We need to think about these things more carefully. And economic benefits and impacts. We are allowed to make money, by the way, because a lot of people feel that economics is just, should be out of that picture. But obviously a lot of this work and a lot of the, the, uh, the issues we're associated with will be providing jobs and growth for Europe as well. So we're not leaving that out. But also the how in there as well, through stakeholder participation, through governance and accountability and openness and what we're calling radical transparency. So that's about impact and this is about how you do it. And these are just common language in papers and frameworks. I won't go into them, but it's very much about solving grand challenges, including participating, not just about money. It's very much um, looking at 
the sort of benefits, risks, back to that definition again. We want it for social good, but we don't want you to cause more problems than we've solved. But whose responsibility is this? It can't be just the little researcher's responsibility doing their thing in their lab. This is a policy responsibility. It's about research councils' directions. It's about policy directions. It's also about um, society itself and NGOs. And, and you know, the whole of the society is there trying to think through these important issues. A little bit more on that, something I did for the uh, the Commission a few years ago. They asked me to do a sort of primer on it, if that's of any interest. And also looking at what the public thinks of this. We did an analysis of the public dialogues that have been done in Europe over a few, number of years on things like on GM, but nanotech and synthetic biology and ICT and a few other geoengineering. And here's very much what they think every time. Oh, that's exciting. That's quite interesting. Oh, it's a bit scary, though. It's a bit scary, isn't it? What, what are you doing about regulating it? What are you doing to make sure it doesn't go wrong? And then we say, yeah, well, you know, are you supportive of this? Well, it depends. It depends on what you're going to do with it, what its impact will be. In, in it's very much the public is supportive, but you've got to prove yourself that it is going to be safe and responsibly used. And then you will get support. Uh, that's a, a little report if you wanted to be interested in that. Th these are on our website. So what does this look like in a university setting? And I think most of you are from universities, so I know there are some who um, aren't. But this is looking quite complicated for them for researchers and for the res within the universities. Is it about science communication? Is it about health and safety? It's about public engagement. It's science and society. It's social acceptability. It's ethics. You know, there's a lot of terms being chucked at research and at universities. And we did a project for the University of Sheffield recently where we started to look at what all those different things to do with um, responsible innovation, components of responsible innovation looked like. And in fact, they're coming at universities from lots of different angles. So it's a unifying theme in a way. You could say that responsible innovation is a unifying theme for changing expectations of universities. Universities place in society, universities accountability for all the public money they're spending. And these are the new hoops they have to jump through. So I don't know if for you this is big, but we have got a big thing on research impact. The impact of public money needs to be spent wisely. And research excellence and new metrics, not just about citations, although we're not there yet because it's still all about citations. That's just um, collaboration and interdisciplin interdisciplinarity. They really push to do that. Now, sometimes collaboration is great. Sometimes it's a disaster. I've been to one with 30 different universities involved. How is that going to work exactly? So they're really pressured to collaborate. Stakeholder in public engagement and involvement, very much pressured for that. In the UK, um, our EPSRC gives 10% on top of every research grant that you can apply for to do public engagement, in addition to the, the grant that you're getting. But no one's taking it up, which I'll come to later. They don't really know how, they don't really know what to do, it's all a bit disconnected. And you'd have thought, 10%, thank you very much, but no. Social acceptability is the, still the thing. How are we going to get the public to buy our lovely science and like it? And outreach is, is associated with that. Data management, big data, open access, open science, that's huge for them. There are departments, huge departments, as you know, focused on data management and in integrity. Gender diversity equality. Again, there's departments on that in terms of the university itself, in terms of its students and that type of area, but it's now focusing down on researchers and they're not really knowing what to do about it often. Ethics and responsibility, lots of ethics committees in universities, but a lot more emphasis now on the ethics of individual research projects and centres. Governance and accountability for public funding, that's big in the UK. What are you doing with our money? We want to know it's worth it. But also talent identification. They just borrowed that from business, I think. How do we get the best researchers? How do we get them to come to us? And how do we train them and manage them and, and motivate them for the future? Now, those are a lot of things, and that is all RRI in a way. That, so this is a lot of pressure on your researchers and a lot of pressure on your university. 
Um, in fact, what we're doing with Sheffield, which is hard to read, but we're trying to look at it in, in this different way, which is if we're going to deliver all these difficult things, we need vision and leadership at where it needs to start. We need to look at what behaviours and expectations we've got. We're putting it under research excellence still because they don't like it to be separate. If it's not about research, and we think that's important, if it's not about the quality, the relevance, the impact of research, don't do it. About teaching and learning, and particularly about reward and recognition. If their incentives are perversely against them engaging with the outside world, you know, how can we expect them to do it? It's not fair to ask. And then training and support. And those little yellow arrows are where I feel that um, science communications can help. They really need your help in those areas. They really need your help, which we'll come to in a second, both in terms of the input and the help with stakeholder involvement and engagement and the help with training on that. So what might this mean for you? Um, I'm going to use this stakeholder engagement framework that we've developed. This is from something called the Public Engagement Triangle, it was invented in the UK. And we have just added this little thing because we think that is the most important bit. So if you can see there, there's communicate, listen, co-create and cogitate. Cogitate is a silly word that English people don't even use. It means to sort of think really hard. And when you say cogitate, there's a sort of like feeling of that about it. You know, it's sort of like, oh God, this is really hard. And so we use that word deliberately because it means it's not easy. It's not blithely, oh yeah, we've done all that, tick, 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 let's go on. You've got to think about this really carefully. It has to have an influence and an impact. As I say to a lot of the researchers that do this work, you know, if you're going to get my sister and my grandma and my brother out to some drafty church hall in the middle of Blooming Sheffield on a Monday night when you've got Grandchester on, which is our big television programme at the moment, you know, it's got to be worth it. It's got to be worth their time. They've got to be able to be influencing and, and affecting and, and actually having some impact on this or else it's just a waste of their time and a waste of their money, actually, which you're also spending at the same time. So let's have a little look at each of these things. Communicate. So we've got there what's the purpose of communication? This is your heartland, so there's nothing I'm really telling you about this. But there's a couple of nuances I think is slightly different now with responsible innovation. I'm looking at this and I've got this, sorry. Very much about sharing expertise and insight, and forming and building awareness. This is bread and butter to you, you know all about this. Educate, enlighten, inform. Um, and motivating and inspiring action and interest in science and interest in research and interest in the university and generally making science and, you know, we're not leaving arts and humanities out of this, but making research interesting and demonstrating its worth to society. But in my land, communication is sort of seen as PR and it's a little bit, yeah, comms, outreach. But also, I'm really wobbling here, aren't I? I'm shaking a bit. Um, one of the things about communication too, it's about demonstrating transparency and it's about demonstrating accountability. And it opens up new conversations. So for example, we're developing some robotic work in Sheffield where they want to demonstrate how responsibly they have done this work. And they want to talk about the processes of engagement and they want to really open up to what they've done to deserve the confidence of stakeholders in their work. I sort of think of it as, I don't know how many young kids you've got, my, my lad is, is, in, in, uh, is about 14 now and it's about showing you working. So I don't know if you, when you talk, talk to them about maths and they know the answer, we know the answer, I know the answer, I don't need to show my workings. No, it's not enough to just have the answer. You need to show your workings to demonstrate that you've got to the answer the right way. And I think it's a bit like that. It's about showing your workings, about showing what you've done to come to the conclusion that you have. Now the tools you know, I'm not even going to tell you about that, but obviously some of the things I would say, this is just a plea to science communicators with research, please get them to get a decent website. I mean, 
all this work that they do and they've got some crappy little WordPress thing that doesn't really work. And, it, you know, what a, it's a window to the world to show what great work they've done and they don't bother because they'll spend, I don't know, one krona. I don't know what I mean, really. They just don't spend any money on it. Please, please do get them to do us all a favor and do a decent website. But very much um, about open source. And again, this is another thing about open science, which is a problem for me. It's all, I can't understand these blooming papers. If they're open to the world, I, you know, I can't really understand them. It's not enough to have nature open or the Institute of Science and Science and so, so open its doors to me. I can't understand a word anyway. So let's think in an innovative way about how we then communicate the findings of those. And I've got in a lot of trouble by think, explaining this and scientists think it's about dumbing down and it's not about dumbing down. It's not about making it less, it's about translating their world to our world. So it's a translation job, not a dumbing down job. So those things you know all about. So let's have a look at the purpose of the listening. Now, I know you do a lot of that as well, and I saw quite of that, a bit of that going on um, earlier. But a lot of this is about getting views of different stakeholders and thinking about them, both po positive, positively and negatively, about the research, about its impacts. So it sounds like a lot of work to explore issues. I mean, that's what researchers do often, but it sounds like it's extra. And it's about consulting those who might influence you. Now, that's what social, account social accountability stuff is all about. It's about let's talk to them and listen to them and understand them so it doesn't hit us on the back of the head when we've got, when, you know, when we launch our product, when we launch our research. But it looks like extra and that's why they don't like to do it because it doesn't look like research very much but it can be it is very much about research it's about um, participatory action research it's about traditional surveys but it's also about innovative thinking about new ways of engaging publics or stakeholders. They could be businesses, they could be policy makers, they could be NGOs, they could be public patient groups, consumer groups, anybody that's relevant to the research. So there are lots of methodologies out there, a lot of them developed by business, interestingly, that we can use for this listening process. Um, and online tools, obviously, growing daily. But I think what training needs and and collaborative help they're really going to need, where I think it's an opportunity for science communication to help fill that gap. It's a new area for a lot of you as well. But we're finding this in the universities in the UK, that the science communicators very much know about this work, but they're never asked and they're not, it's not part of their job description. And we're finding that changing in the UK. So the public engagement department or the science communication department is becoming perhaps the stakeholder involvement department and helping them with this stuff, doing training programs and that type of thing. And just one thing to say, because this happens time and time and time again. When you're getting the public and when you're getting stakeholders involved in this research, that's not the end. We have to involve and keep them involved. We have to give them feedback as to why their time and effort has been well spent. We have to look to researchers to see what have they done with their input and, what, uh, and, and how has their work helped. We've had a great one where um, we have a data pr protection law and we found when we'd done a huge dialogue, massive dialogue of hundreds of thousands of people, um, we couldn't give any feedback to them too because we had to throw all the names and addresses away. <laughs> so the whole second part of the project couldn't be done because we had to throw the names and addresses away. But really don't forget that because that's particularly important, societally important. Moving very quickly, um, the co-creation bit, do you call it co-production, co-creation, collaboration with society? Very much 
you know, encapsulated by that brilliant citizen science project that you saw earlier. This is about working with partners, um, working with NGOs. I mean, we work with Greenpeace on projects. We work with rich social groups and, and consumer groups. Um, they are really wanting to work with the rigor and with the, the, the brilliance of science and social science as a, on a collaborative basis. But it's really hard. It's quite difficult. So we're not expecting that this is easy and we're not expecting it to happen overnight. And we're not expecting it to happen in every case. It has to be of value for both parties. But that's where I think a lot of um, responsible innovation is, will, will come to, which this is this whole idea of working with society, with and for society, the listening and the co-creation. And the tools of that, and we've got citizen science, so it's beyond traditional academic collaboration. It's about participatory processes and participatory action research is a, is a really bona fide age old sort of research methodology that when you say it's a bit like that, oh right, yeah, oh yeah, okay. Make it look like research, don't make it look like separate something separate. Um, crowdsourcing citizen science type initiatives, mediation, conflict resolution and partnership broking skills are all very useful and I think this is another opportunity for science communication. You're very good at bringing, um, bringing people together and I think there are skill sets there that might be opportunities in the future for you guys um, that you may or may not have now that this co-creation type work will bring. And they need it, and they're desperately, desperately, desperately in need of help. So anybody that knows what they're doing, they really will want help. Um, but very much relationship building in advance. The biggest thing, I did a, an NGO consultation on this. Please do not give us a ring three days before the bid is due. Ask us to be a partner and expect us to jump to your little research tune. So this is what happens. This happens to me all the time. I know when Horizon 2020 bids are going because I get all these phone calls and emails from people. So, uh, you know, at least three months, please. But um, this is the big issue and the big challenge is to build relationships first before it really needs it. And, and that's tricky to ask. But most important of all, this cogitation. What are you going to do with all this work, all this thinking, all this listening, all this input? How is it going to make a difference to the research? How is it going to make for better research? And in what ways has this sort of involvement influenced research? That's the whole thing. We've got multi thousand pound projects in the UK, particularly government sponsored policy projects. And then we just tick a box and think, right, we've consulted the public. Great, let's just get on with it. So this is what very much responsible research and innovation is about. It's about taking this stuff to heart and doing something differently than you would have done before you had this input. And it's difficult, it really is hard. But if not, why not? I mean, I'm doing quite a bit of work on behavioural sciences and our, all of our cognitive biases, back to those first slides. You know, yeah, they're not really for us. That's not really interesting. You know, tr just notice how we actually have biases about opinions of different types of people and bring them into our research. Now, this is for researchers particularly. So looking at those, let's have a very quick look at the barriers that face researchers here, because I've got to go. My boss says it's a waste of time. It detracts from my publications. There's no money. It won't do my career any good. I haven't got time and I don't know how. Now, to be honest, all of these things are right. All of these things are true. The whole focus on citations makes a lot of this a waste of their time. So research council people, do something about that, please. Um, sometimes it might not do their career any good. A lot of UK universities are promoting people to professorship just on their engagement, not on their citations. And that's a very big deal in the science land. They are third class professors, of course. But, you know, this is where we have to go with this. We have to reward and recognise and acknowledge this. And there is no money, research councils people. So we need more money for it, please. Um, so how can you help researchers? You can help them by helping them understand what RRI is. We can help you by deciding what RRI is and trying to help work with you all to actually see what it means in real life. We can respond to challenging expectations in grants. They really need help. In the UK, we've got a box that big. They've got to tick on what responsible innovation is. They haven't a clue what to do. They need help, help. 
how to involve stakeholders, how to do collaboration with NGOs and others, and how to communicate their findings better. So I think in a way, I think there are great opportunities for science communication um, to include, to improve the impact and influence um, of their work. And I think good luck to you all, you're gonna need help. But I think it's a very, very rewarding area and I think a very interesting and exciting place to be at the moment um, with all of this going on and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hilary. Um, actually, I will open up the floor for questions now, just in a few seconds. But first, I'd like to ask you, because Anna Maria, when she introduced this afternoon, she said that we're always looking to Great Britain because you are the best in this. I know. Yeah. Honestly, we, I actually laughed because you had London calling last year and then you had me this year and I was talking to some of the speakers from last year and we're sort of saying, we're not the experts, we're hopeless. <laughs> you know, so please don't think that we are the experts. We are really scrabbling around in the dark trying to make this work. We have got some innovative things that we're doing. We have got some inter interesting things and we're, but you have also got some innovative things going on too. So we definitely definitely don't want to think of ourselves as the experts, really, really, really. As you see, I don't know if you saw, I was going, oh no, I'm not an expert. <laughs> but we're all in this together. And I think Europe particularly is doing some very thoughtful, innovative, interesting work. So there are no experts. We're all on a journey, as they say. <laughs> and I think we're all in it together. <laughs> but okay, I, I, don't, I don't really agree. But, but, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but what are you, uh, if you would point out something that we should learn from you? I mean, what, what, what are you really good at? What is Britain really good at? Yes. I think we're better at working together with stakeholders than most. I think um, uh, that the, the, the community of NGOs and the community of consumer groups are perhaps more embedded within um, some of the research process and the university collaborations than in most places. Yeah. I would so point to somebody here to ask a question, so please make a question because soon I will point to you and then you will have to have a good question. Uh, but is that because, uh, what you s said now, is that because of all these crises that you put out in the beginning? I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. But also it makes it more frightening. So I have, a, I have a little training thing I do on talking to people who hate you. So we're expecting people, you know, I do some work with some GM scientists. We're expecting them to go out to the world. Not only are we supposed to talk to people who are going to throw things at them, but we're expecting them to change their research based on the opinion of somebody whose opinion they don't even rate. I mean, you know, that's actually verging on the stupid, really, isn't it? <laughs> so it's not human nature to do these things, but we're asking people to be different and think differently. Um, and I think it's a tough thing to do. So now I'll point to somebody here. No, seriously. We have two mics. We've got them there. We have one? Yeah. These Twitter people, where are my little Twitter Could people you, uh, who I've while, been talking to? While you're walking to? there, yeah. while you're walking, yes, we have one. While you're walking, uh, I have one question to the audience, actually. Can you help me translate cogitate? Cogitate. Cogitate. Can you help me translate that? Does somebody have a good translation for that? It's a tricky word. Yes, what do you say? Grubla. Begrunda. Begrunda, is that good? Can we vote for that? Vegetera, is that good? <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry, they're laughing. I'm sorry. No, they're not laughing. At British you. people no. don't really know about it either. But there's just one person who used to use it, and we all knew what he meant. So we sort of it's did a perfect it buzzword. Nobody knows what it means. But we did it Excellent. on purpose because then you had to think what, what it meant, Excellent. and therefore that's why we'd use it. Sorry, we had a question over there. Hi. Uh, Hi. Please stand, stand up, up and, yeah. and and your name, please. Thanks. Ninad Bondre from Elevate Scientific and uh, an affiliate with Lean Shipping University. Uh, there's two words that I didn't find in your talk, and I might have missed them, so correct me if I'm wrong. But they are self-interest and power. Ah. Uh, and in some, some senses, these two factor into this whole process. Uh, I was just wondering if this is accounted for in, in the RRI process. T that last bit of sentence you said, you're wondering if it's yeah, a... Uh, if and how it is accounted for uh, in your yeah. framework of RRI. Yeah. 
think oh, I am cynical and I am a bit cynical. I'm a lot cynical. I don't think anybody does anything without a real self-interest, you know, and not self-interest, but as, you know, a self-expression. So when we're looking at this from a research point of view, it is genuinely true. If it's not going to enhance your quality, relevance or impact of your research, it's a total waste of your time. We happen to feel that it does and that you will find through the processes that your research is enhanced. But actually there are occasions, and I'm sure there are in, certainly in some of the, the blue sky areas, that it's really not relevant. So it is quite right that it has to be a self-interest. When we talk to the innovation piece, now we don't, we're not really talking about that here, but I do quite a lot of work talking to businesses. You know, the, the self-interest there is still a reputational risk interest. And actually, sometimes they don't really need it and nothing really bad happens if they don't do it. Um, in terms of power, I don't even know where to start on that. I think there are issues of power, both um, disparities of power um, in terms of, no, I'll tell you what, I won't go there because it just goes a long way. Both missing, both right, but I don't know really what to say about them except for doing another speech. <laughs> Good. Another question? Do we have one here? Here is one. And we have the one over there. Anders, yes. Good. Please stand up and say your name. Hello. My name is Ulva. I'm working for the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, I'm wondering how much uh, relevance do you think press and, and communications like uh, media play yeah. in this role? Yeah. Just curious to hear that. Huge. Huge in two, in two ways, really, in that part of the problem is that however, you know, however brilliantly you can do your work, it can just be taken and totally misinterpreted, and that's the big fear. But also, um, we're finding in the UK that apart from the sort of the, the tabloid people who are going to say what they say. The science journalists themselves are really trying very hard now to be more thoughtful and more rounded and, and, and explain better what they're doing. And I think that, you know, the, the Science Media Centre, who you had last year, doing a lot of work on that, I think really worth doing that. I think part of the problem for me for things like GM is that everybody's so frightened that they just duck. And therefore, we need to help catalyze people to talk and stick up for themselves and be um, more out there and more open. Because I think from certainly, let's take GM, they communicated in a vacuum. You know, the, everybody just ran for cover who was in the whole GM science area. They just got fed up of it all. And the whole anti-GM uh, area just took over everything. But so we're saying, you know, you really still have to just stand up there and, and fight your corner and talk about things in evidence-based way, but also try not to be so boring that no one wants to listen to you. And hopefully that's your job. <laughs> but yeah, huge. Over that, there we have a yeah, sorry. No, no go. That's the only place anybody gets any information from. That's the trouble. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for a very interesting and inspiring speech. I'm Eva Krutmeyer. I would like to hear a bit more on um, on this sort of um, question of risk and certainty that is also uh, an intrinsic value of science itself. And yep. and when we do science, we we work with a successive knowledge yeah way. so it always contains a lot of uncertainties yes. and and risks for different stakeholders and so on so i'm interested in how this more responsible innovation um, thinking of the, yours can be applied yes and, uh, me myself feel that the uncertainty principle is uh, sometimes not very useful <laughs> yes other tools <laughs> yes so please uh, a few sentences on that to help Yes. Now, and again, a lot of this depends, let's say you have the innovation chain from blue sky research, research, invention, innovation, policy, each area of that sort of innovation, holistic innovation uh, uh, chain, holistic innovation chain, that's not right, um, perhaps has its own areas of responsibility and own issues to consider. So, for example, on nanotechnology, where, which I started doing a lot of work in early on, um, and, and, and the public and stakeholders' views on this, was that 
in the very early ages of research, as long as you have good lab practices and those research integrity things, there isn't a particular concern too much about toxic, you know, toxicology and, and, and risk in the lab. It's when it starts to go out. Now, there obviously are things like, you know, transporting organisms, you know, and those things that you do with any toxicological pr product. Um, it's when it starts to become applied that that becomes an issue. So, for example, with nanotech, you know, they really weren't sure what the behavior of some of these nanoparticles were, and they were starting to be used. And so, and you know, synthetic biology, some of these others, these are novel risks that really need to be thought about. But the biggest lesson for us, we've, we found from nanotechnology for other technologies, was, and this was the NGO said this to me in a conversation about lessons from nanotech, is we spent too much time thinking about the ology and not enough time thinking about what are we really worried about and what are we not really worried about. And so our learning on that is let's get down as quickly as possible through research, through you know conversations, collaborations to what are we really worried about and what are we really not worried about. Um, and I think we're getting there with that. And what are the remaining uncertainties still? Um, because it's a bit of a myth that the public is so worried about risk. When we did a dialogue, there was another dialogue, um, the public said, when it all goes wrong, have you thought about what to do? Now, that's not the public saying, you've got to have it risk-free, it's got to be risk-free. That is a myth. The public are not expecting it to be risk-free. They just know that it's going to go wrong more than you think, more than you're expecting. What have you done in advance to, to, to sort that out and, and to respond effectively? I don't know if that... Thank you. We have time for one more question. Yes, final. I was fascinated by your comment about the web pages being boring, <laughs> because during my sort of 20 years of working with the web, I've seen a number of good web pages being killed by university efforts to make them all look the same. Oh, really? And I think that is, I've seen it, seeing it happening again now. Ah. And of course, people protest and do their own blogs or whatever, but it's, it's kind of a fight between having a university standard and having personal style of a research project. Right. So, so I don't know if someone else wants to comment on that. You know, I didn't know that was the case. I'm afraid I didn't know that was the case. Um, yes, you've got to do... I mean, my, my that was a response, actually, to... How, you know the research bids, but I hadn't appreciated that. I, I'm doing some work with some universities to give more portals and more sort of. So, for example, with Sheffield, what we're trying to do is doing case studies on RRI, and there's lots of components. It might be gender, it might be stakeholder involvement, and be the portal so that all the different projects can put their, you know, like like that, the, the, your project. You can they can put those examples there and showcase their work um, in a different way, and then you can point things to it. But I'm still not going to forgive him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that pretty much wraps that up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Thank you very Hillary. much. A warm applaud. And oh, so please don't go. <laughs> oh, what love? Oh, oh, oh Prezies. It's a little gift. Mm. Can I open it now? Yes. I'm having my drink and I can open it now. Sauce. Oh, yes. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Original, Lovely, thanks. Isn't it? Yes.